Last Easter, a group inspired by the so-called Islamic State attacked churches and hotels in Sri Lanka. The bomber's every move was captured on security cameras. He got quite close to my face and I remember finding that really uncomfortable. Um, he was almost breathing in my face. Eight men triggered huge suicide bombs. 269 people were murdered. The door just opened. I saw something that uh, I never thought that I would see. In the months and years before, the Sri Lankan government had dozens of warnings. It is unconscionable that senior uh, elected officials were made aware of warnings and of intelligence reports and absolutely failed to investigate. Despite the warnings, the bombers remained free. Had they acted promptly, there would be no Easter Sunday attack. Colombo, the capital of the island paradise of Sri Lanka. Easter Sunday, a year ago. Shangri-La Hotel is the new and is a very luxurious hotel. You know, whenever I book to Sri Lanka, I always tend to stay in a Shangri-La Hotel. So I kind of feel safe and you know, uh, secured uh, being in that hotel. A British academic who'd fled from Sri Lanka as a child refugee is visiting. I remember just looking through the window and I thought, oh, it's a beautiful day. Two Australian friends are staying at the same hotel. It was amazing. The beach was right in front of the big glass windows at the front of the, the hotel and it was lovely. It was a lovely place. Um, one of the nicer hotels I've ever stayed at. That Easter, CCTV captured a handful of local men checking into several luxury hotels in the city. Two of them at the Shangri-La. Less than a mile away from the Shangri-La, the Cinnamon Grand Hotel. That morning, Kieran woke up early and said he was hungry. He was insistent that we go early. And so we collected my mother and walked to the Cinnamon Grand. Dalsini lived in America with her son. She took Kieran to Sri Lanka to visit his grandmother. I'm very proud of my Sri Lankan heritage. I wanted Kieran to love it as I do. And he did. He felt so at home from, you know, day one. Sri Lanka is a melting pot of different religions, the majority Buddhists, but also Hindus, Muslims and Christians. Easter Sunday is a special day for the Christians. Easter Sunday is a very joyful day for all the Catholics. After the Mass, they go to their own houses and they have some parties, you know, to share the joy of the resurrection of Jesus. St. Sebastian's Church in Nagombo, 20 miles north of the capital. It's one of the largest churches on the island. There were nearly 800 to 1,000 people inside the church. So the church was packed, uh, with the, the, especially with the elderly people. A young man walks towards the church. A 
Anusha and her family are in the congregation. Apite edavas hari vedagat, api hatar dene ata meke vedagat. Auru the visi hatara kura avatar na. Ek api hamu paas kuiri daavakam. Paula kidiye tapi evidiye te yana. Api alu utten dumenge dala. Hari masa vinta mai palli dhan. The man wearing a rucksack crosses the courtyard and enters the church. Halaveni ma banku eta mai mage mahatyai putai wadi la hiti. Ita piti passe banku e mai duai wadi la hiti. Piri me kene atul le no dekka mama loku traveling back eka daang hiti loku eka. We heard people uh, shouting in agony. Some were crying, some were shouting, and some were asking the help, please help us. दुबटा खाता हकरा, दुबे खाता करे ना, बाकी महत्त्या वो यागत्ते या दालती है ना, एंगली वाले गोड़ा कुम्भ दूर। इन्हीं के पासे पान देने का तब बाकी महत्त्या ही पुताई वराई की है ना, मन दुबे में बेरा गांड था मैं क्या कह रही हूँ इन्हीं के पासे Anusha and her daughter are rushed to hospital. But doctors can't save Sajini. At the same time as the attack on St. Sebastian's, another bomb explodes in Colombo. Fifty-four people are killed at St. Anthony's Shrine. Two minutes later, just over a mile away at the Kingsbury Hotel, another bomb goes off. Three huge bombs had exploded across the island in quick succession, targeting Christians and tourists. Who could be capable of planning such a deadly and sophisticated attack? It was what one expert who tracked the growth of Islamist extremism round the globe for 25 years had long feared. The attack clearly demonstrated that the Islamic State or ISIS has now arrived in Sri Lanka and there was a new wave of terrorism that was going to affect Asia and Sri Lanka was going to be a key center. That morning at the five-star Shangri-La, guests are waking up, unaware a hotel has been bombed just 500 yards away. We were on our way to breakfast, and then we realised it was Easter as we were um, getting into the lift, and so we, I said Happy Easter, and, and 
He said it back. Two other guests check their rucksacks before they head towards the lift. As they make their way down to breakfast, they are smiling. We walked into the restaurant past all of the stations of food. I remember picking up a little smoothie thing on my way. Waitress was trying to find us a, a table right by the big, um, the big glass windows at the front. As we were standing there, these two men pushed past us, and it was quite odd. Right behind the Australian couple, the hotel's CCTV shows the men. They were swinging around these um, big backpacks that I found quite odd at the time, uh, particularly because. I only had my, my room key with me and my phone. They were sort of standing even closer than you and I, you and I are right now and, and talking in quite hushed tones. One guy was looking quite intently around the area. He got quite close to my face and I remember finding that really uncomfortable. Um, he was almost breathing in my face. Sam and Hanukkah are given a table at the far end of the restaurant. Annika stood up, she said, I'm going to the, the buffet area, and she must have taken three or four steps. All I remember was hearing a sound coming from my right. The next thing I knew, um, I, was, I was on the ground and I, um, I couldn't hear anything. Everything's normal, and then it's not. Right, it was like the, the air was sucked out of the room almost. Glass blows out, roof comes down. I, I remember water coming down. Uh, it just, uh, it's almost indescribable how just this, this the power. Um, and slowly, slowly sound came back. I could hear some sounds from people who sounded like they were in pain. And the next thing I knew, I was on the ground and Hanukkah was sort of crawling towards me, saying, I'm scared, I'm scared. I could see water kind of gushing from the ceiling and I thought maybe that the, the building was collapsing in on itself. The man who triggered the massive bomb at the Shangri-La was the ringleader of the Easter attacks. He came from the east coast of Sri Lanka, from Katankudi, a Muslim town. His name was Zahran Hashim. Katankudi is the ground zero of terrorism. That is where the Islamic State emerged in Sri Lanka. This is Zaharan's hometown. And it is in Katankudi that Zaharan planned, prepared the terrorist network that mounted the bloody Easter Sunday attack. Zaharan studied here at this traditional Islamic college. For three years, he memorized the Quran, taught by Mulvi Aliyar. From an early age, Zahran was different from the other students. Zaharan 
முற்றுமுழுதாக விலைக்கு விடுவோம் என்பதாக நாங்கள் விலக்கிவிட்டோம் Zahran moved to another mosque. He started up his own increasingly hardline group. அப்பாவிகளை கொல்லலாமா அப்படினு கேக்குறாங்க. அப்பாவி என்ற ஒரு சாரார் முதல்ல இஸ்லாத்தில் இல்லை. ஒருவன் முஸ்லிமாக இருப்பான் அல்லது காஃபிராக இருப்பான். இஸ்லாம் மனிதர்களை By 2016, Zahran Hashim was producing more and more extremist videos like this one distributed on YouTube and Facebook. His preaching alarmed Muslim leaders who alerted the authorities. When I looked at the video I was shocked. And he's supposed to be uh, a learned person in Islam and that you know he was talking all rubbish. You know that Islam does not preach violence against innocents. So we as a group immediately reported him to national intelligence. Zahran was put under surveillance but allowed to continue his inflammatory speeches often attracting large crowds. 2 years before the Easter attacks he hired this hall in Katankudi to make a very public declaration. It rang alarm bells with the secretary of the local mosques Abu Sali Uwais. He spoke in support of the ISIS, which an enemy. The Islamic State. An Islamic State. Did the authorities know what he was saying? We were informed by the spectators at the meeting that there were intelligence officers as well. For decades, the different forms of Islam coexisted peacefully in Katankudi, but Zahran now claimed that Sufi Muslims were heretics. His group turned up with swords in the streets of a Sufi neighborhood. Secretary of the main Sufi mosque, Malvi Sahlan. Now, two people are coming. One wife page was there. Sunday, our mother was there. And then, at the end, NDJ people, our Khayil Khan and their wives were there. They were going to get married. But they are not. They are going to get married. மற்றது அடிபட்டு தாக்கப்பட்டது ஒருவர் ரெண்டு பேருக்கு தான் இவர் உடனடியாக கைது செய்யுங்க கைது செய்து நடவடிக்கை எடுங்க என்கிறதையும் தெரிவிச்சு வேண்டும் ஜஹ்ரான்ஸ்டாபிஷ்ஸ் Every time we checked, they said, no, we are still trying to find where he is. It seems incredible in an island like Sri Lanka, which has a very well-developed security apparatus, that they were unable to find this man. Well, I don't think they took it seriously enough, uh, thinking that he could resort to terrorism, right? He was just taken in as a loudmouth hate monger. The government were well aware the Islamic State group had established links to Sri Lanka. In 2014, four Muslim families from here had gone to Syria. Thirty months before the Easter Sunday bomb blast, I revealed that in the Parliament that there is a serious threat. Thirty-two. people are involved in the isis activities and had their training in uh, syria and i categorically said that they might blast bombs i requested the government to take action to prevent any kind of uh, disaster uh, that i predicted and what happened nothing happened At the Shangri-La that Sunday morning, as people fled the bomb blast, CCTV shows a second bomber. 
watching where the survivors are going, waiting for the moment. 40 seconds after the first bomb, he triggers his. I realized that I left my debit card um, back, in my, uh, back in my room. So I decided, let me just run back and get my debit card. And I remember just you know, uh, walking into the lift, just going down slowly. And uh, suddenly I hear this big thud, uh, big noise. And I can hear the lift next to me, it's kind of jerked. I hear screaming, uh, screaming of children, you know, screaming. But my lift was just, it was going down. The second bomb has gone off right by the lifts, just outside the restaurant, to catch people fleeing the first one. The lift stops, you know, makes this like a ding sound. The door just opened and, and I saw, um, and I can, uh, yeah, I, I saw something that uh, I never thought that I would see. The glass completely, where it should be one of the restaurants, is completely shattered. And I can see all of the uh, bodies and bloods. All we were smelling is blood, you know, the whole air smell of blood. I've never been so scared in my life. Honestly, um, that feeling was just, was just utter fear. I didn't know if someone had a gun, I didn't know if there were more bombs everywhere, I, just, I didn't know what to do. Sam and Hanukkah edge towards what's left of the window. And I was sort of yelling out, what's going on, what's going on? And they were sort of motioning to duck down. So that made me think, well, there's someone roaming around, you know, picking people off. As I was kind of walking towards Sam and looking down, I realised that the floor was just... was, um, was just covered in pieces of people, I guess, and the insides of people. As I looked down and saw that, I noticed that I, from head to toe, was just, I was covered in blood and like, pieces of stuff as well. Hanukkah and I rushed towards that exit. There was, fortunately, we saw this group of, sort of six kids running out as well, which is really, you know, fantastic to, to see them survive. Um, with one guy who was sort of struggling with all of them, so we ushered them out down the stairways and ran down the emergency exit. For Kieran, it was a flashback to the bloody civil war that gripped Sri Lanka for 25 years. A war he'd lived through as a child. He was sent to England to save his life when his brother was killed. When you see bodies, I, when I was young, when I was 11 years old, I saw my brother was shot and he died in my arm and I seen all of that. But that was more dignified way, you know, even to compare to what I saw in Shangri-La. Um, Shangri-La is more, it's brutal. Four months before the Easter bombings, in the central highlands, there was a clear warning Zahran was recruiting young Muslims. Zahran was conducting Quran classes to young people. And you know, the, the families gladly sent their children thinking that you know, they were learning something good. They didn't realize that you know, they were being radicalized. Zahran was using his Muslim recruits to stir up ethnic violence. When Buddhist statues were vandalized at Mawanella, 13 young people were arrested. It's claimed they'd been inspired by Zahran. He was operating openly, but still the police failed to track him down. We also found that Zaharan was not only in Mavanalda, he had a few other places where he was conducting classes. So, I mean, that is something which the investigators 
followed up, right? So they took it quite seriously, but they couldn't trace him. Zahran even recruited followers from one of the wealthiest, most high-profile Muslim families on the island. They would be key to the funding of this complex plot. Uh, the Ibrahim family is one of the biggest spice merchants in the country. And the father was well connected. And I do not believe that, you know, the father even dreamt that his children would uh, uh, get into this. The two sons, Ilham and Inshaf, helped run their father's lucrative spice business. They were children who were driving around in BMW and Merck cars, right? And they were just normal uh, modern kids. But of course, you know, uh, they had been religious. They are the super rich in Sri Lanka. Both their sons, Ilham and Insaf, were recruited and they funded Zahran's group. And it was Ilham who detonated the second bomb at the Shangri-La, just seconds after Zahran pulled the trigger on the first. That morning, near Zahran's hometown of Katankudi, a stranger arrives. He's seen on CCTV going into a mosque to prepare himself for the day ahead. 500 yards away, the Zion church, Christians are preparing for the Easter service. When I met the people, they were very happy to uh, celebrate the day of the resurrection of Jesus. So that's a very happy day for them. The pastor's son, Malkia, is there with his father. He was very happy on that day because he wore the new shirt on that day, uh, the purple one. Chris Anthony is teaching Sunday school at the church. Sunday school, we have a special special worship. Um, the young man at the mosque prays too. And in all the Sunday school, the man from the mosque arrives at the church. I noticed him. He wore that uh, pink colour shirt. When I noticed his face, um, he was sweating. Was he carrying anything? He is carrying a bag, the backpack, like so. Chris Anthony finishes Sunday school and sees her husband, Ramesh, across the courtyard at the entrance to the church. When I Ramesh was going to go to the church, I was going to go to the church. I was going to go to the church. I was going to talk to the church. I was going to go to the church. Then I was going to go to the church. Then Ramesh was going to tell me about the Zion Church records the sound of their service starting.
எல்லாமே அப்ப அப்படியே நின்றது ரமேஷ் நின்ற இடத்துல வந்து நெருப்பு பற்றி எரிஞ்சு கொண்டிருக்கு அவ்வளவு தீ அந்த இடம் எல்லாரும் சின்ன பிள்ளைகள் வளர்ந்தவங்க எல்லாரும் அங்கே இங்கே ஓடி தங்களோட உறவுகளை தேடி கொண்டிருந்தாங்க என்ற ஹஸ்பண்ட் மற்றவங்கட உயிரை காக்கும்படிக்காக ஜீசஸில் ஒரு ஏவுதலோடு அந்த இடத்துல நின்று செயல்பட்டார் சேர்ச்சுக்குள்ளே இப்படிப்பட்ட ஒரு தெரியாத ஒரு தீமை விளைவிக்க வந்த ஒரு மனுஷனை போகாதபடி தடுத்தார் மற்றவங்க இதால் இத்தனையோ உயிர்கள் காக்கப்பட்டிருக்கிறாங்க Just before the service started, Pastor Kumaran had left the church to take another service nearby. When I turned my bike, I noticed there's a big thick smoke coming out of that area. When I entered the church, um uh, it's it's bring the picture like it's my church, it's my people. when i noticed the bodies then only i it come into my mind about my children then i ask the people where about my children 14 children are killed scores wounded pastor kumaran searches all day in the hospital for his son until this 6:15 of that evening i don't know about my son's dead uh with the piece of cloth on his shoulder from that only i identify that uh, he is my son so that was the purple shirt that he was wearing for the first yeah, time yeah that's a piece of cloth on the shoulder is remain was remain there Three months earlier, in a remote spot on the north coast, there was an explicit warning. Muhammad Taslim, a local Muslim counselor who'd been tracking Zahran's activities, led the police to an arms cache. 125 kilos of explosives and 99 detonators. They knew after that camp was raided that zahran was behind this had they acted promptly there would be no easter sunday attack once again zahran got away after the raid the counselor who led the police to the arms cache and his wife were left unprotected and paid the price நாளைய காலுக்கு தான் எனக்கு ஒரு சவுண்ட் பண்ணிச்சு ஃபோன் வெடிச்சிற மாதிரி தான் எனக்கு அந்த சவுண்ட் விளங்கிச்சு முடிச்சு பார்த்தா ஃபோன் வெடிச்சு இல்லை ஃபோன் பக்கத்துலேயே இருந்துச்சு அதோட என்னமோ தெரியாண்டு இவரை நான் எழுப்பினேன் எலும்புங்க எலும்புங்கண்டு அந்த எழுப்புறதோடு தான் எலும்பல்ல சஹ்ரான் ஹெட் சென்ட் ஒன் ஆஃப் ஹிஸ் மேன் டு பிரேக் இன் டு தஸ்லிம்ஸ் ஹவுஸ் and kill him while he slept beside his wife he was shot in the head at point blank range pai motha pitnalal nu yosirpa appi motha indena per varlatta nenu patti anadharavan nilila uttaram kaani parattunna na ikira taslim was paralyzed down his left side ஏசு சண்டே நடந்த போன் பிளாஸ பார்த்த டிவியில் பார்த்து நீந்த பார்த்துட்டு அழுதாரு சரி மட்டும் அழுதாரு நிறைய சமணிஞ்சு விடு பொம்மை செய்கிறதுக்கான பவுடர் அதே மாதிரி பயங்கரவாத தேவையானதான் சமணிஞ்சு இதை தேடி பிடிச்சி இந்த இவ்வளோ நடந்திருக்காதுன்னு சொல்லி இருநூத்தி ஐம்பது ரூபாயும் பழி பண்ணு நினைச்சேன் இஸ் அ ஹீரோ because he informed the sri lankan authorities that 
the Islamic State was building a terrorist training camp and a storage dump very close to the ocean where more weapons and more explosives would come. Four men were arrested after the discovery in the coconut grove. But one of them was soon released, Ilham Ibrahim, who went on to bomb the Shangri-La. Then the government of Sri Lanka received the starkest warning of all, 17 days before the attacks. The Indian security services told them Zahran Hashim was planning suicide bombings. Zahran has brought explosives to conduct the attacks in Sri Lanka from India. Based on that, the Indian intelligence was able to map Zahran's network in India and feed that intelligence back to the Sri Lankan services. Twelve days before the bombings, the information was finally passed to the head of the police. A top-secret government document refers to Indian intelligence which said, Zaran Hashim and his associates are planning to carry out a suicide attack in Sri Lanka shortly. They are planning to target some important churches. Yet two days before the attacks, the man named in that intelligence, Zahran Hashim and his accomplice, were able to freely walk into the Shangri-La to plan their attack. The Indian intelligence had live sources in Zahran's network, so they were able to provide very precise intelligence of even the targets and when the attack is going to take place. It is very rarely in the world, in the domain of counter-terrorism, where such accurate and precise intelligence is ever provided. We always sat in the same formation um, in, at a table by the window. My mother and son both like to look at the koi fish in the pond. We were just chatting about the day and Kieran fetched juice for himself and for my mother. At the Cinnamon Grand, CCTV shows Kieran returning from the buffet to sit with his mother and grandmother. And I said, you know, sweetheart, it's past nine, we need to hurry a bit. Across the restaurant is Inshaf Ibrahim, the elder son of the wealthy spice trader. He paces up and down, Then he triggers his bomb. When I realized what was happening, it was the sound of my own screaming that brought me to awareness. I stood up and saw the, um, the carnage. The lights were off. There was glass, broken glass, water, um, bits of ceiling, hanging, wires, every, all over. Um, and then I started hearing, you know, the screaming and seeing the bodies. I turned around and saw Kieran. He was slumped. And so I stepped around the table and grabbed his face and yelled, you know, um, you know, baby, baby, open your eyes, you know, look at me. 
Um, I saw a little flicker of movement, um, but he wasn't able to open his eyes all the way. I saw a restaurant manager and screamed to him to come carry Kieran out. In the rush to hospital, Dulcini and Kieran are separated. I was placed in a wheelchair, my mother as well, and wheeled off. As we entered the emergency, I recognized my son's foot. He was on the first bed. I would know his foot anywhere. They were never able to restore a heartbeat or circulation. He'd been struck directly to the heart by a piece of shrapnel. My poor baby didn't have a chance. In the weeks before the attacks, Zahran moved his group into this safe house in Colombo, one of a dozen around the island, and he set up more training camps. To mount a coordinated simultaneous attack, within 25 minutes, seven strikes, it required very significant planning and preparation, recruitment radicalization, the finance, the training, the surveillance and reconnaissance of targets, and then maintaining the security of the operation to successfully mount that attack. Zahran and his group prepared a video to make clear who had inspired them. They pledged allegiance to the leader of the Islamic State group. Five days before the bombings, a motorcycle was blown up near Katankudi. It was a test run. On the very morning of the bombings, just a couple of hours before, Indian intelligence sends yet another warning of an imminent attack on churches and tourists. But still no action from the authorities. CCTV captures an eighth bomber, preparing to attack another luxury hotel, the Taj Samudra in Colombo. A rucksack on his back he takes a lift alongside a woman and her two children. This bomber had direct contact with the Islamic State group. The key IS link to the Sri Lanka attacks is by a man called Jamil. Jamil Mohammed came from this small Muslim village in the Central Highlands. His family were wealthy tea traders, according to Malvi Lebe from the mosque. Jamil de Kuluma in the Urla or Gaura Mana Kuluma Mahiran. Latif Hajar or a Kanil or Perir Bodhi in the Palitanda. Jamil was a conscientious student. Very active, very null, Katikara or Manuanathan, our Inga Rundari. Elaradan Allah Sirichi Mahundari. Rather Kelly Potum, our Velinadil Puna the home, Palavahan Kaluela Katakunda the home. Anna, our Angadan, Ipudiana or Paiji Patrick Lamala, Ipudiana brain was not at the Patrick Lamdil, Nanga Haradrum. Jamil spent time in Britain. 
He studied at Kingston University in southwest London. He was educated in the United Kingdom. During that time, he became a member of Al Muhajirin, of Anjem Chowdhury. So he was radicalized in the United Kingdom. The British Islamist Anjum Chowdhury was later convicted of inviting support for the Islamic State group. Jamil also linked up in Australia with this man who became an IS recruiter in Syria. So I invite the Muslims to come here. I tell you that this is the land of life. Jamil tried to join IS in Syria himself, but was turned away at the Turkish border. Back in Sri Lanka, Jamil teamed up with Zahran and made a crucial link to an IS cell in India. Zahran's group in Sri Lanka was directed by a network that was in South India. And that network is directly linked to the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. That Easter Sunday, Jamil walks into the Taj Hotel restaurant and takes out his phone. It seems that he is waiting for a message. His rucksack, weighing 50 pounds, is packed with iron nails, ball bearings, and a high explosive that's a hallmark of the Islamic State. Jamil repeatedly presses the detonator, but it won't work. Frustrated, he decides to leave. Minutes later, he checks out. Unsuspecting porters help him with his bags. Then he hails a tuk-tuk. Jamil checks into a small guest house, then heads to a nearby mosque. He seems to agonize over what to do. Early in the afternoon, he returns to the guest house. The explosion is caught on CCTV. Jamil kills himself and two guests. As the police finally follow up leads they've had for months, they surround the house of the man who bombed the Shangri-La, Ilham Ibrahim. His pregnant wife detonates a suicide vest, killing herself, her three young children, and three police officers. Police track down Zahran's family. As they approach, his younger brothers record a video. Rilwan has a bomb strapped to his waist. <laughs> and Zayan sits with a child on his lap. They're with their father. Three suicide bombs left craters in the floor. The men killed themselves, their wives, 
and six children. That is the ideology of Islamic State. That is they radicalize entire families. The family unit become the main entity that carries out the attack. In the house, the police discovered a drone. This video recording from it has never been seen publicly before. It indicated further attacks were being planned on tourist resorts. Zaharan's group filmed the seafront of Katankudi using a drone. Zaharan was building a drone capability, but they were in a very early stage. Certainly, Zaharan would have built explosive-laden drones over time because that was the direction in which he was moving. At the end of the video, the man flying the drone is revealed to be Zahran's brother, Rilwan. So why did this group slaughter so many innocent people last Easter in Sri Lanka? The answer lies 3,000 miles away in Syria. A month before the Sri Lanka bombings, the Islamic State group were losing their last stronghold, surrounded on all sides in a battle to the death. The instruction to attack churches, the instruction to attack luxury hotels came from IS Central. The Christians and the Catholics of Sri Lanka had done no harm to the Muslims, but they were brutally killed, maimed and injured because that was the wish of IS Central in Iraq and Syria. Eight days after the Sri Lanka bombings, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of the IS group, appeared in a video. It was his first since he declared a caliphate five years earlier. Baghdadi singled out the Easter bombers, praising them for avenging the loss of IS's last foothold in Syria. It was to be his last video before the Americans found his hiding place. Al-Baghdadi took his own life, but his group lives on. The Islamic State is no longer a Middle East-centric group. It has spread in parts of Africa, in the Middle East and in Asia. It has entered a phase of global expansion. Two hundred and sixty-nine people were murdered on Easter Sunday. Among them, at least 45 children. We could have just postponed the service, if not we could have just changed the date and the time and we could, we could have cancelled the service. But the authorities did not come with the message, pass on the message. They must be punished so that uh, hereafter such a thing will not happen. They must be responsible. There was no public alert, even when the attacks were underway. When we sat down for breakfast that morning, 
I had absolutely no idea that there had been three terrorist attacks already that morning. There was no information communicated. We would have stayed home. We would have not gone to dine in the restaurant. I wouldn't be sitting here with you today. I'd be with my son. So how could the Easter bombings have happened after all the warnings? The answer lies in the dysfunctional government of the day. For months before the attack, there had been a constitutional crisis. The president tried to sack his prime minister. Our police had all the information, but they did not take so seriously. How can the politicians, the ministers in charge of those uh, security divisions say that I was not aware, that is not an excuse. They must take the responsibility. In the poisoned political atmosphere, vital information fell between the cracks. There was more than 150 reports that the Prime Minister and the President knew of that was presented before government. Easter Sunday was not a failure of intelligence. It's a failure to appreciate intelligence and to act on intelligence. The president declared he did not receive the all-important Indian intelligence. The prime minister says he was kept out of the loop on security matters. It is unconscionable that dozens of people in government, the highest senior elected officials, were made aware of warnings and of intelligence reports and absolutely failed to investigate. A year on, Sri Lanka's new government is still investigating why so many warnings were ignored and who is to blame. Kieran's father and I feel that it is a call for accountability the highest elected officials. We've had no acknowledgement that we've lost the most precious person in our lives from the Sri Lankan government, nothing at all, not even a condolence. The Sunday after the bombings, Christians gathered on the streets of Colombo for a memorial service. What happened in Sri Lanka is a warning to us all. The Islamic State group will exploit weak states, flawed systems that fail to act on intelligence, wherever they may be.